All right, welcome everyone to the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission's winter meeting of the Atlantic Striped Bass Management Board. My name is Marty Gary from the Potomac River Fisheries Commission on the board chair. Our vice chair is Megan Ware from Maine. And Emily Franco is our ASMFC FMP coordinator. I'm also joined at the front by our ASMFC science lead, Dr. Katie Drew. Um, for today's meeting, before we get going, I'd like to recognize some new faces around the table for the board. Uh, first virtually attending, we have from Maine, um, represent, Representative Allison Hepler from Maine. So Allison online, welcome to the Stripe Pass Board. Also at the table, uh, not necessarily new, he's been at the board before, but not in a while, is Jesse Hornstein from New York. Jesse, welcome to the board. And also we have, let's see, Chad. Jim yeah, Thomas. Yep, I'm sorry, Chad Thomas from the state of North Carolina. Chad, in the far right there, welcome, Chad. And we also have several commissioners who are participating virtually today, including Sheree Patterson from New Hampshire, David Borden from Rhode Island, Tom Foley from New Jersey, Craig Pugh from Delaware, Michael Easy from Maryland, Jerry Mannon from North Carolina. I may be missing a couple, but I'll be late looking to Emily to help me out uh, to allow those folks to participate in our meeting today. We'll go ahead and start off with uh, approval of the agenda. And I'd ask if there are any modifications or additions to the agenda. I'll look to the board for those. None here in, in, in person, anybody online, Emily? No, seeing none, the agenda is approved by consent. Well, let's go to approval of the proceedings from the November annual meeting from November 2022. Are there any edits to the proceedings of the meetings from October, I'm sorry, November 2022? Not seeing any here in the room, none online. Then by consent, we'll approve the proceedings from November 2022. Next up on the agenda, public comment for items that are not on the agenda today. I will look to the room to see if any, there's any public comment. Raise your hand, please. And I'd also ask if there's anybody online for any comment for items that are not on the agenda. I'm not seeing any hands raised in the room. Emily, is there any hands up online? Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and continue to move on. And we will move on to item number four, which is addendum one on ocean commercial quota transfers for final approval. I have a three step process. We're going to review the, the options and public comment summary. Emily is going to provide that to us. Then we're going to review the advisory panel report. Emily will give that to us. And then we'll move into action. So, Emily, I'll turn to you for the review of the options and the public comments summary. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. So today I will provide an overview of the draft addendum, uh, the proposed management options, um, as well as the public comment summary and the advisory panel report. And the board action for consideration today is to select a management option and consider final approval of addendum one. So starting with the statement of the problem for this draft addendum, there have been several questions and concerns raised about the striped bass commercial quota system over the years. Uh, for example, particular concern about the use of 1970s as the reference period for the quotas. And these questions and concerns were included as part of the scoping uh, document for draft amendment seven back in 2021. But the issue of commercial quota was not selected for further development at that time and some board members did express uh, support for addressing commercial quota issues separately from um, Amendment 7. So in August 2021, the board initiated this draft addendum 1 to consider allowing for the voluntary transfer of commercial quota in the ocean region specifically. And this action was initiated to consider a management option that could provide some more immediate relief to states that are currently seeking a change to their commercial quota. And other commission managed species do allow for quota transfers uh, between states, and these transfers can address issues like shifting stocks, quota overages, et cetera. So here's the timeline for this management action. 
After the board initiated the draft addendum in August 2021, the board then postponed the addendum until August 2022, at which point the board provided additional guidance to revise the draft. And then the board approved the revised draft addendum in November 2022 for public comment. And then we had public hearings and uh, public comments accepted uh, throughout December 2022 and January 2023. And then today the board is considering uh, final action on this addendum. So just a brief background for this addendum, uh, first being the status of the striped bass stock. As a reminder, we just had the 2022 stock assessment update for striped bass which indicates the stock is over, still overfished, but no longer experiencing overfishing relative to the reference points. Uh, the assessment also indicated that under the current fishing mortality rate, there is about a 78% chance the stock will rebuild to the spawning stock biomass target by 2029, which is the rebuilding deadline. So moving on to commercial management specifically in the striped bass fishery. For the ocean fishery, the FMP establishes state by state commercial quotas. And then for the Chesapeake Bay, the FMP establishes one total baywide quota, which is then allocated per the mutual agreement of the Chesapeake Bay states amongst themselves. And then for all the quotas, any overages are paid back the following year. The rollover of unused quota from one year to the next is not permitted. And then currently quota transfers between states are not permitted. So the focus here of this draft addendum is considering quota transfers in the ocean region specifically. So you can see here, this is the table of the current state by state commercial quotas for the ocean. Uh, this does incorporate any approved conservation equivalency programs you can see the total ocean quota across all states is about 2.4 million pounds. As a reminder, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and New Jersey prohibit the commercial harvest of striped bass. And then also note that New Jersey does reallocate their commercial quota to their recreational bonus program. So for the most recent fishing year, we have data for, which was 2021. Uh, 2021 saw about 5.1 million removals of striped bass across both the commercial and recreational sectors. About 12% of that total in 2021 was commercial harvest. About 2% was commercial dead discards. About 36% was recreational harvest. And about 50% was recreational release mortality. And for commercial landings, specifically in 2021, the ocean commercial fisheries landed about 1.8 million pounds out of their 2.4 million pound quota. And in the Chesapeake Bay uh, landed about 2.4 million pounds out of their 3 million pound quota. So the ocean commercial fishery does consistently underutilize its total quota. And some of that quota is not used because striped bass are not always available in state waters. This is particularly true for North Carolina, which holds about 13% of the ocean quota, but has had zero uh, ocean commercial harvest since 2012. And then second, as I mentioned, some quota is not used because states, some states prohibit commercial harvest. So those states that prohibit commercial harvest collectively hold about 10% of the ocean quota. And then for states that do have active commercial fisheries, there are several factors that impact how much of the quota is, is harvested each year, including year class availability, overall abundance, near shore availability, um, overall effort, and also state management programs. So this table shows what percent of each state's quota was landed for the past three years. Um, again, you can see the states that prohibit commercial fishing obviously landed 0% of their quota in the commercial fishery. The other states with active commercial fisheries, uh, most of them landed over 90% of their quota in 2021. Again, the exception is North Carolina, uh, which has used 0% of the quota, again, because the fish just haven't been there um, off the coast of North Carolina. So looking across all state quotas, uh, at the bottom row, you can see about 76% of the total ocean quota was landed in the commercial fishery in 2021. 
So this is just a, a longer look at that quota utilization for the past 10 years. Um, you can see the landings have been below the quota up there in red every year, somewhere between 50 to 76% of the quota has been landed in the commercial fishery. So there is some concern that allowing commercial quota transfers could increase uh, how much of that ocean quota is utilized, and this could potentially undermine the goals of the addendum six reductions that were implemented back in 2020. Uh, since the fishery has consistently underutilized its quota due to the fish availability and also to some states prohibiting harvest, Addendum 6 assumed that the commercial fishery would continue to underutilize its quota to the same degree. Um, and so this assumption might be violated if commercial quota transfers are allowed and that unused quota starts to be used. So I'll get in now to the uh, five proposed management options in the draft addendum. So these options consider allowing for the voluntary transfer of commercial quota in the ocean region between states that have quota. So these options do not address the Chesapeake Bay quota at all, and they do not consider transfers between the ocean and the Chesapeake Bay or vice versa. And also note that commercial quota that has been reallocated to a state's recreational fishery. So for example, New Jersey's quota that's been reallocated to their recreational fishery is not eligible to be used for quota transfers. So if transfers are permitted, quota would be transferred pound for pound between states. And there would be some uncertainty associated with transfers between states that harvest different size fish uh, we know state fisheries catch different size striped bass due to a variety of reasons, um, including the variability in size distribution of striped bass along the coast. Um, also, states have uh, different commercial size limits, different gears, seasons, et cetera. Um, and then also through conservation equivalency over time, states have adjusted their commercial size limits from the historical standard size limit. So this has resulted to changes in some state quotas over time. So overall, a pound of striped bass quota is not equal across all states, and some of the proposed options do incorporate a provision to try and address this discrepancy. So looking at the specific options, uh, first we have option A. This is the status quo in which commercial quota transfers are not permitted. So all of the alternative options, B through E, would allow voluntary quota transfers, and they range from sort of the least restrictive option, option B, all the way through the most restrictive option, option E. So I'll get into each of those uh, in more detail. So option B is the general transfer provision. So voluntary transfers would be permitted with no restrictions, but there would be a conservation tax if the stock is overfished. So there would be no limit on how much quota can be transferred, but if transfers occur when the stock is overfished, there would be a 5% conservation tax to address the issue that a pound of quota is not equal across all states. So for example, if state A transfers 10,000 pounds to state B while the stock is overfished, state B would receive 9,500 pounds of that transfer, and the remaining 500 pounds would be that conservation tax, which would be no longer available for harvest that year. Option C would limit transfers based on stock status. So transfers would be permitted, except transfers would not be permitted at all when the stock is overfished. So there's no limit on how much can be transferred, but when the stock is overfished, transfers could not happen at all. Um, it is important to note that because the stock is currently overfished, this type of option would not provide near-term relief to states that are currently seeking additional quota. Option D is the board discretion option. So for this type of option, the board would decide whether voluntary transfers are permitted every one to two years based on information available on stock status and the performance of the fisheries. Um, if the board does decide to allow transfers when the stock is overfished, there would be a 5% conservation tax, 
to address that issue that a pound of quota is not equal across states. So the other aspect of this option D is that the board can, in addition to deciding whether or not transfers are allowed, the board can specify certain criteria for these transfers. So the board could, for example, first set a limit on the transferable amount of quota, so how much quota could be transferred in a given year. The board could also set a seasonal limitation on that limit. So for example, the board could say, no more than 50% of how much can be transferred can be transferred in the first half of the year. And then finally, the board could also determine a state's eligibility for a transfer based on how much a state has landed. So for example, the board could say, a state cannot ask for a transfer until they've landed X percent of their quota. If the board does select this option today, the board could also decide whether or not to allow uh, 2023 transfers for this year um, at this meeting. And then the board would start this regular process of deciding about transfers in advance. So for 2024, the board would need to make that decision by the fall of this year. And then finally, we have option E. This would be the most restrictive option. Um, so just like the previous option D, the board would have discretion and decide whether transfers are permitted every one to two years, except for this option, no transfers could occur at all when the stock is overfished. So the board could still set certain criteria, um, but transfers couldn't happen at all when the stock is overfished. And again, um, important to note that because the stock is currently overfished, this type of option would not provide near-term relief to states. So if transfers are permitted with any of those alternative options, uh, there is a general process for how voluntary transfers occur. Transfers require a donor and a receiving state, and transfers between states may occur upon agreement of those two states at any time during the year and up to 45 days after the calendar year ends. And the board today, when approving the addendum, could specify any number from zero to 45 days if the board wanted to limit when transfers can occur after the year ends. So the administrative commissioners from each state must submit a signed letter to the commission regarding the transfer. The transfer becomes final when states receive written confirmation letters back from commission staff. And then once quota has been transferred, the state receiving quota becomes responsible for any overages to that quota and also any transfers don't permanently impact state quota shares so every state resets to their original quota amount quota amount each year so the final section of the addendum is the compliance section any measures approved by the board through this addendum would be effective immediately and if transfers are permitted, states would need to account for any pot potential additional quota through transfers um, when they're uh, determining how many commercial tags they need for the next season. And also just a note here that if the board does select status quo option A today, that would mean that there is no change to current management. So in that case, there would be no final addendum document because management is not changing we would add a note to the FMP review to acknowledge that the draft addendum one process took place, what was discussed, um, but if option A is selected, that is no change to current management. So I'll now uh, provide a summary of all the public comments that we received on this draft addendum. Uh, public comments were accepted through January 13th, 2023. We received a total of 1,979 written comments. Uh, those included 759 individual written comments, 1,190 comments through six different form letters, and also written comments from 30 organizations. Uh, eight public hearings were held that covered 12 jurisdictions in December and January. Uh, five of those hearings were webinar only, two of them were a hybrid format, and then one of them was in person only. We had 193 public individuals attend the hearings. Uh, that's not including state staff, commissioners, commission staff. 
Um, and live polls or a show of hands were used at most hearings uh, for the proposed options. And also note that some people did attend multiple hearings and provide comments at multiple hearings. So here is the comment count. You can see that the vast majority of comments favored the status quo option A, no transfers permitted, with 1,950 written comments and 155 public hearing comments in favor of the status quo option A. Of those who did favor the alternatives, option B through E, option B, which is transfers allowed with the, con with the overfished conservation tax, had the most support of those alternatives. So for those favoring option A, the status quo, the majority of comments, the most common rationale was concern about expanding harvest and increasing fishing mortality when the stock is rebuilding, when the stock is overfished, and also when the stock is experiencing poor recruitment. Um, commenters noted that management uh, should focus on rebuilding the stock and not maximizing harvest. Uh, comments noted that allowing quota transfers would jeopardize rebuilding and also noted that the board has uh, rejected quota transfers in the past. Some comments noted that allowing transfers would be in conflict with the stakeholder input received during the Amendment 7 process in support of uh, conservation. And then some comments noted that if states aren't able to harvest their full quotas, that indicates the stock may not be doing well, and so extra quota shouldn't be transferred or harvested by another state. So for those in support of option B, uh, which is the transfers permitted with overfish tax, uh, many commenters in support of option B noted that they were commercial fishermen and they noted that quota transfers would allow for the efficient use of commercial quota. They also noted that the small impact of striped bass quota transfers on the overall fishery because the commercial fishery is relatively small compared to the recreational fishery. Uh, comments also noted that the commercial fishery already has accountability measures in place uh, with payback for any quota overages also noted that transfers could help avoid regulatory, regulatory discards after states fill their quota, and also noted the benefits of transfers seen for other species as well. Uh, there was no specific rationale provided for option C, so moving on to option D, those that supported this board discretion option noted that some discretion on transfers would be beneficial uh, but also cautioned against too much oversight and setting overly restrictive criteria. And then those in favor of option E, which is board discretion, but no transfers at all when the stock is overfished, uh, noted that this option would provide maximum oversight by the board um, and would support caution during rebuilding while still benefiting states that are seeking additional quota. So commenters also raised additional topics, uh, including concern that uh, commercial fisheries are removing large breeding females from the population, concern also about ongoing CE programs and support for ending current CE programs. Uh, comments noted that the commercial sector should have the same size limits as the recreational sector. There was also concern about the potential for a future moratorium if the stock doesn't recover. Uh, some support for ending commercial harvest and making striped bass a game fish, and then concern also about menhaden harvest in the Chesapeake Bay, and concern about impacts from commercial gill nets. So I'll now also provide the advisory panel report. Um, the advisory panel chair, Lou Bassano, asked that I provide the report today in his stead. So the advisory panel met via webinar on January 17th to discuss this draft addendum. Uh, the AP members discussed their recommended options and also provided some additional recommendations on the transfer process and also on the quota system in general. So a majority of AP members on the call, 14, supported status quo option A, transfers not permitted. Uh, there were a few reasons. Those included that transfers are not appropriate while the stock is overfished and rebuilding, 
and there shouldn't be any increase in either sector's harvest while the stock is overfished. Uh, the AP noted the public comments are overwhelmingly in support of option A. Transfers will not benefit the stock, especially when the stock is overfished. There is concern that quota transfers could set up the potential for non-transparent horse trading of quota. It was also noted that as long as the stock is overfished, the stock needs that buffer of not harvesting the North Carolina quota. And also concern that if quota is transferred north along the coast, um, that there's concern that large breeding females would be taken out of the fishery and there would be more loss of spawning potential there. Um, and in general concern about moving quota around and the potential for that impacting the rebuilding analysis and our assumed size of commercial catch since striped bass, different size striped bass are caught in different states. And then it was also noted that the stock is experiencing recruitment failure in the Chesapeake Bay, so this would be a time for caution. A few AP members, uh, four of them on the call, did support option B, transfers permitted with an overfished conservation tax. Those AP no members noted that the quotas were developed scientifically and the science would not set quotas, total quotas that would jeopardize the stock. Again, the, they noted that the commercial fishery is already constrained and has payback and accountability provisions in place. Um, also noted that the fishery is primarily recreational and with the commercial fishery only at 10% of total removals with relatively stable landings that allowing transfers would not have a significant impact. So some AP members also noted some additional recommendations about the quota transfer process itself. So if the board does allow transfers, a few AP members recommend the board eliminate the 45 day provision, allowing transfers up to 45 days after the year ends. There was concern that having this provision might lead to states being less careful about going over their quota since they could potentially cover a quota overage after the year ends. Uh, a few AP members also recommended that transfers be permitted only for states that allow commercial fishing. So the states that prohibit commercial fishing, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and New Jersey should not be able to transfer their quota. And then one AP member recommends revising the quota utilization calculation um, there was concern that calculating that percent utilization, incorporating those states that don't harvest, um, don't have a commercial harvest is misleading. And so those states that harvest 0% should not be included in the calculation. And then the AP discussed, you know, if the board does not allow transfers at this time, uh, should transfers be considered in the future? And the AP was split on that. So some AP members would support revisiting transfers after the stock is rebuilt. Uh, that would be a more appropriate timing from their perspective. Some AP members don't support revisiting the transfer issue in the future at all. So from their perspective, transfers should not be allowed in any case, um, and that transfers are not an appropriate tool for the striped bass fishery. And then some AP members were un uncertain about whether transfers should be considered in the future. Um, they noted that when the stock is rebuilt, quota transfers could be a tool to respond to climate change and shifting stocks, but only if that tool was controlled properly. And then finally, there were a couple of recommendations on the general commercial quota system. A few AP members recommend the board re-examine the quota system overall because it's based on data from the 1970s and the data should be re-evaluated and science has advanced since that time. And then one AP member recommends the board take a broader perspective and re-examine uh, the contribution of each sector to the fishery overall. So that concludes the AP report as well as the public comment summary. So I'm happy to take questions on anything that I presented. Thank you, Emily. Um, so before we do entertain questions for Emily um, from the AP um, report and from the public comments, uh, we'll entertain, uh, we will be pivoting to the final action on the board. Please hold your motions until that time. I, I do want to start that part of it off with a motion, but for now, 
we'll strictly do questions for Emily. Um, and we do have some folks online participating virtually, so I'm going to be looking to Emily to toggle back and forth periodically. So we'll open this up for questions for Emily. Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Emily, one of the comments in there in the AP summary caught my eye um, on that slide about whether or not, you know, if the board decides not to approve transfers at this time, should they revisit the question, the comment that transfers are not an appropriate tool for the striped bass fishery? Can you elaborate on that at all, like some of the discussion or comments around that idea? Yeah, so uh, there wasn't too much in-depth discussion there. The discussion that we always had, I think, was concern about because striped bass, there's different size striped bass harvested among the states, and each state's fishery is a little bit unique, that transfers are just not the most appropriate tool, given the uncertainty there of transferring different size striped bass among states. So I think that was the primary reason um, in that discussion. And AP members noted, although transfers are used for other fisheries and other species, that with that uncertainty, that it just would be appropriate for the striped bass fishery. Additional questions for Emily? Steve Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Emily, it was a great presentation. If you can follow what I've written down here and scribble along as you talk, maybe you can explain it to me. We're currently under Addendum 6, and under that we have a 78% uh, likelihood of success rate in the current management plan. That is assuming that we aren't going to use all the quota that we're going to have a likelihood of unused quota. I think that I'm, I don't want to misquote you, but that seems to be what you said. So to the current projections for the assessment assume that we maintain the same fishing mortality rate. So the addendum six reductions from 2020 did indeed assume that the commercial quota would have the same utilization rate, that there would still be some unused quota. Um, the specific assessment projections are specific to the fishing mortality rate and not necessarily that assumption. I'll turn to Katie if I'm if I'm missing anything. So it's it's you know addendum six specifically had that commercial quota assumption, but the assessment projections are just looking at F, which is a combination of recreational and commercial. Yes, Steve. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. I'm, so I'm trying to figure this out. Are we at a 78% likelihood of success under the current management plan based on the current real mortality rate with effort or based on what we projected? And if it's real, then what was the success rate in the plan not knowing, the likelihood of success not knowing what the actual fishing mortality would be, not the a lot of so I think I, I followed most of that so the projections are based on the fishing mortality rate from 2021 so we're based on if we maintain that same fishing mortality rate every year the same as we had in 2021 then we'll have that 78 percent chance of rebuilding the stock the assessment doesn't differentiate between whether like how much of that fishing mortality rate is you know from the recreational or from the commercial side it's just taking that overall fishing mortality rate so you know if commercial harvest increased but you know recreational removals decreased and fishing mortality stayed the same the assessment would just take that as fishing mortality staying the same if that's helpful at all and i'll see if katie has anything to add can i answer your question steve close. Uh, when we do most of these projections, we have a projected harvest rate and a projected success rate. You are saying we have a we have a quota, but we know we're not going to harvest all of it. So we, we went from what we think we're going to harvest at, which is below what we've allowed them to harvest at, to come up with this success rate. And my question is more, what would the likelihood of success in this plan been if we caught the full quota. 
So, right. So we, uh, we didn't run those projections. So we ran the projection assuming that we would stay at the fishing mortality rate in 2021. We did do another set of projections where we assumed that the fishing mortality rate would increase up to the F target as well as to the F threshold. And that does bring your chance of success down. But we did not specifically look at a scenario where we did it in terms of removals of fully utilizing that commercial quota um, or of increasing recreational harvest by X or Y percent. So we did not do those sets of projections um, for the assessment update. And if I may, Mr. Chair, so we had put together this backup slide because this was a, a frequently asked question during the public hearings. Um, so this question of sort of how, if previously unused quota is used, how would that impact the rebuilding timeline from the stock assessment? And, you know, the answer is commercial harvest could increase, but without new projections, we can't say if that would, how much that would increase F or if it would decrease that probability of rebuilding or how much it would decrease that 78% chance of rebuilding. So we can't say that without new projections. Um, again, that depends on how much of the previously unused quota is harvested or transferred. And also, again, the total fishing mortality rate depends on both commercial and recreational. So we can look at, I put a table up here, we can estimate how much removals might change. So for example, this is, these are rough estimates. You know, we, we took a look at removals, assuming that the same size fish would have been harvested as they were in 2021. If, you know, the North Carolina quota was transferred and harvested on top of what was harvested in 2021, you will see somewhere around less than a 1% increase in total removals. If we're talking about the scenario that you brought up, if all the ocean quotas, every state's quota was fully utilized, including those states without commercial fisheries, we might see around a 1% increase in total removals. So again, this is how much removals might increase, but we can't say without new projections how much that might increase F overall. Thank you. That's, that answered my question. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Emily and Katie. Um, this time I turn to Emily. Is there any hands raised from board members online that want to ask a question? Okay. Back to the room. Any additional questions for Emily? Dennis Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The advisory committee expressed a concern about whether if we maintain status quo, whether we could revisit transfers in the future. And I think, it, in my opinion, it would be clear that we always could do, a board can do what it chooses in the future, regardless of the outcome of this. So choosing status quo would not preclude the fact of revisiting quota transfers at any time in the future, not, not correct? That is correct. The board can absolutely revisit this in the future. Um, from the advisory panel's perspective, there was a the conversation was whether or not the board should, from their perspective, revisit it in the future. But absolutely, the board could revisit this if they would like. Thank you, Dennis. Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Emily, for your presentation. So I'm just looking at the slide that you have up there now, um, where it's an estimate that 0.2 to 0.5 percent um, increase from 2021 total removals if the North Carolina quota is harvested on top of the 2021 removals, right? The first first line in that in that table. So I'm just wondering. So at that 0.2 to 0.5 percent, is is that this probably? I'm guessing. So I'll ask the question. Is that within the error bounds of that estimate of rebuilding by 2029? Right, that 0.5 percent. We haven't taken a look at those to see if that's within the error, the error bars there. I think the important sort of caveat here is we're assuming, you know, for all states, the size of the fish harvested doesn't change, and for this range is because we don't know if the North Carolina quota is transferred elsewhere, what size those fish will be. 
Um, so we have this range, and I'm not sure if they're within the confidence intervals. I answer your question, Emerson. All right. Any additional questions for Emily? Anyone mind? All right. So we will move to consideration for final approval of addendum one. And I would look to start the conversation if anyone has a motion. And John Clark from the first state with the first hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, indeed. I do have a motion. Um, I sent it to Emily, so, but not a big surprise. I'll, should I just wait till it's up there, Emily, or? It should be up momentarily. Yes, okay. thank you. Short and sweet. Uh, move to approve option D, board discretion for commercial quota transfer provision with the overfished conservation tax. And if I can get a second, I'd like to speak to it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Is there a second to the motion? Steve Train. So we have a motion to approve option D, board discretion, commercial quota transfer provision with overfish conservation tax. Motion by Mr. Clark, seconded by Mr. Train. All right, we'll open this up to discussion. John, I'll look to you as the maker of the motion to uh, expand upon your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wish I had better powers of persuasion, but let me go ahead and start here. Um, as Emily pointed out in the presentation, option D is one of the more restrictive transfer provisions. It gives the board discretion every year to decide whether the population can support transfers. So, uh, you know, I think that should calm some of the concerns that people have about allowing transfers because we'd be looking at it as a board. Uh, y, D instead of E, which would have taken the overfish status into account and wouldn't have allowed transfers unless the stock was not overfished. Um, I may be alone or in Delaware may be alone, but these spawning stock biomass reference points are extremely conservative. It takes a while for the assessments to catch up with the population. And my thinking is, is that we all see striped bass in our states. We know when the population is recovering. And so I thought this would help the commercial fishery in that um, as the board sees recoveries uh, occurring out there, that they may be able to approve transfers before the stock is officially considered no longer overfished. Uh, as Emily Slide just pointed out there, uh, we're not picking on North Carolina, of course, but North Carolina is where the unused quota is. And it is not even 1% of the total recreational and commercial removals. And uh, that doesn't seem to be likely to have much of an effect on either the assessment results or the regulatory restrictions states must take based on the assessment. And that's if the entire quota was transferred, which uh, with option D, the board has the power to approve whether the transfers will be allowed and how much transfer will be allowed. And uh, because of that, of course, if the board felt comfortable with 20% of the North Carolina quota being transferred, obviously that's probably a rounding error in terms of our removals every year, but to a state like Delaware, that would be a huge help. Um, why are we pursuing this approach in Delaware instead of a full reallocation, which we know people have suggested you should just reallocate the commercial quota, and we know what a cluster fudge that reallocations turn into, and we'd be here for you know, I mean, maybe by the time I retire, but maybe not even until after I'm dead, that would probably happen. So in any event, um, you know, I just think this, we think in Delaware that this is the fastest, easiest, uh, and hopefully the uh, uh, a method that people have oversight over and can agree to, to allow some states that, uh, get more quota. Now, Delaware has been advocating for more quota for years. Obviously, the timing isn't great to be asking for a quota transfer when the population status is overfished. We pursued this approach, as I said, because of the difficulty of getting reallocation done. Uh, we greatly respect the concern that recreational anglers show about this issue, but once again, we want to keep it in perspective. This is a very small amount of striped bass. 
the board can defer allowing transfers until the population is recovering robustly under this option. And it brings us closer to fixing inequities in the original quota allocation. So for all those reasons, I'm hoping the board can support this option. Thank you. Thank you, John. Steve, as seconder, would you like to expand on John's comments? I have different comments, but yes, uh, um, as, as a member of a state that's received quota transfers in a different species, I understand the importance of this type of tool to allow a state to uh, harvest a resource that may be misappropriately uh, quoted off uh, based on the change of the, the location of the resource. And I think that this option doesn't require it to be transferred. Uh, even the full transfer from one state would still have us around a half a percent difference. Um, so I think it's something that should possibly be available. But this option is at board discretion, which means it doesn't have to be done. Thank you, Steve. Um, before we open this up to full board discussion, um, I had a question for, for John. Um, and we may have mentioned this before, but I was curious about the scope, the size of the commercial fishery in Delaware that has the need for the transfers, if there's something you could comment to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you look at the table, you'll see that Delaware, uh, we have a very well-managed commercial fishery every spring. Our commercial fishermen get the gear in, get the gear out because they want to move on to crabbing. And so um, we can easily accommodate more. Uh, Initially, we would like to at least get back to where we were with um, under Amendment 6, which would be probably about 50 to 60,000 pounds of quota. So once again, if the entire North Carolina quota is much less than 1%, we're talking really a fraction of a percent here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering if you would indulge me for just a moment or two to add a little context to this request uh, in John's motion. There, there are really two reasons uh, Delaware feels that it would be important uh, to pass option D. One is the 72 to 79 landings uh, are not verifiable for a variety of reasons, at least in our state and some other states. Um, there was no mandatory catch reporting in our state back in 72 to 79. The landing statistics were compiled by National Marine Fishery Service employee coming to Delaware for an annual visit, maybe a couple times a year. Um, the records were voluntary that, that the uh, uh, gill netters submitted for purposes of compilation of the 72 to 79 landings. They're unverifiable. They may be overestimates, they may be underestimates. We don't know. The second reason why we feel, the first reason being we don't feel that the 72 to 79 landings are, looking at it from today's point of view, are an appropriate resource to use to allocate the stock. The second reason, has to do with the dissipation of the Delaware River pollution block. In the, in the 60s and 70s, there was a 30 mile long pollution block in the Delaware River that virtually precluded striped bass spawning from the Delaware River. So you could, you could reasonably ask where did the, the, the landings that Delaware um, produced, where did they come from? Well, primarily from through the CND Canal from transfers from Chesapeake Bay, there was relatively little reproduction in the Delaware River during that period of time. With the, with the construction of five major sewage treatment plants in the Philadelphia area in the 1970s and into the middle 1980s, uh, gradually striped bass reproduction came back in the Delaware River and the species was declared restored in 98. So what I'm saying is, Delaware fishermen never had the opportunity to fish on Delaware-produced striped bass during the period of record because there simply was very little production in the Delaware River during that period of record. Could their landings have been higher? I know that requires speculation, but my guess is yes. They could have been considerably higher during that period of record had there been successful spawning. Thank you. 
Thank you, Roy. I appreciate your personal history and exposure. That's really very insightful. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, next go to Jason McNamee and then to Dennis Abbott. Dr. McNamee. Mr. Chair, um, what I'd like to do here is offer a, a substitute motion if uh, the time is appropriate to do that. Let me let me do this. I'm going to honor that that substitute. Um, if you don't have any other further comment, I want to go to Dennis. Let him make his comment and then double back. That's okay. That work perfectly fine, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jason beat me to the punch because I was going to do the same thing. So he made it easy, Jason. Go ahead. Thank you, Dennis, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'd like to offer a substitute motion here, and uh, what I'd like to substitute is to move to postpone action on Addendum 1 and task the technical committee with running two population projections. The first one would be one which assumes harvest of the entire ocean commercial quota from all states. And the second one would be one which assumes harvest of the ocean commercial quota from all states except New Jersey, and then parenthetical since their quota is reallocated out of the commercial fishery. The technical committee may use their expert judgment on the other needed assumptions for the projections, i.e. selectivity, to produce the most realistic output for consideration by the board. So if I get a second uh, to that motion, I'd be happy to provide my rationale behind that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I have a second to the motion? Is there one on one line, Emily? That's or, is that a second? Oh, that's not. So we're looking for a second to this motion. Johnson Davis. Here we have a motion by Dr. McNamee, second by Dr. Davis. Um, Jason, do you want to go ahead and expand on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple of a couple of reasons for for doing this. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this in both the public comment and uh, the advisory panel also uh, made mention of it. And then uh, Steve Train also brought up a, a similar um, point. And so what this um, would do is it would provide an answer to some of those comments, these comments about, well, what would happen if uh, the commercial quota was harvested? Does it impact rebuilding? Um, does it... Um, you know, have a meaningful impact uh, on the stock. And so, you know, when I was reading those comments, we can answer that question uh, with uh, the model that we have in the projections that we run. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, I, I thought they were really observant comments that were made and I thought it would be helpful to the board to actually have an answer um, to kind of at least get some clarity on one of those things that uh, people were bringing up. In another manner, it seems as if people are uncomfortable with harvesting the commercial quota. Um, and I find that a little bit odd. I think if we are setting a commercial quota, we should be comfortable with harvesting that commercial quota. I'm not, I'm not saying we should harvest the commercial quota. What I'm getting at is this will give us an opportunity to kind of understand the commercial quota a little better in the context of the population. And if it's not an appropriate quota level, we can, you know, have information and adjust it uh, if, uh, if that's appropriate. So we'll get a sense of whether or not this commercial quota is set at a reasonable level. Um, just a, a logistical one is my understanding that the technical committee is all, already working on some projections. So I am asking them for additional work, but at least I'm not pulling anyone off the bench. They're already out in the field playing ball. So, you know, it's, it's additional work, but um, hopefully not a, a huge burden uh, on the technical committee as they're already kind of working on, um, you know, some of this type of thing. Uh, and then finally, it'll allow the board to make a more informed decision uh, when we take this back up. So I'll park it there, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the time. 
Thank you, Jason. Justin, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this motion from Dr. McNamee and support it. Uh, to me, what's really clear is that the public here and with this action, as with Addendum 6, as with Amendment 7, is just very concerned about the stock being rebuilt by 2029. And, you know, in my view, the public's voicing very reasonable concerns that increases in removals could affect the recovery timeline that we're on. I think this work can inform that question as to whether you know additional removals on the commercial side will materially impact the rebuilding plan. Uh, I think you know thinking back to the November meeting, I wouldn't have been willing to consider additional removals on the recreational side, adjusting measures there without some information on what those changes would do to our rebuilding timeline. So I think here we're just asking for the same thing, given that we're you know, considering additional removals on the commercial side wanting to better understand how that might impact rebuilding. So I think this is a really reasonable ask and will hopefully allow us to make a, you know, more informed decision when we come back for final action at a later date. Thank you, Justin. Um, Chris, Chris Bad Savage has his hand up, but I'm gonna pivot to online and do we have any hands raised there, Emily? Good. All right, I think we have Dave Sikorsky online. Um, Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was originally raising my hand to be in the queue uh, to possibly substitute the original motion. I'll park that for now and if just ask that you keep me on the list and how things progress here. Um, in looking at this motion, um, I'm against uh, really the first sentence, or at least the first half of the first sentence in postponing action on this addendum. Um, I'm in the reallocation camp. Um, I think Roy made some really important comments about the history there and and ultimately, I think that's the right thing to do to properly um, provide access to this fishery. Um, I'm in that camp once we're rebuilt. Um, and, and so obviously it does push us down, down the timeline quite a bit, but I think that's the right thing to do given everything we've um, been through, what the public is looking for. Um, and let me just clearly say that when I say rebuilt, I say rebuilt on the timeline and the, uh, the, the goal we have in place, not moving that goal of uh, something else the public has long said. So. Now, ultimately, I think this additional analysis would be helpful. So I'm supportive of that component. Um, I would also hope that we could get a better picture of um, of what F looked like through 2022, something I think is in the queue possibly uh, for the May meeting based on November conversations, um, because I think that'll give us a good picture of what's happening with the recreational fisheries that we know is, is difficult to constrain and, and obviously impacts our rebuilding the most. Um, so, you know, the, generally in speaking, I think we're in the margins here um, as far as the, the potential um, value of this information. Um, so, you know, it's just some comments at this point. And if, if you have an opportunity, I'd, I'd, I'd of course like to um, you know, possibly substitute down the road. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. I've noted uh, that you're interested in seeing how this plays out in a possible substitution. Uh, Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, actually, uh, Dave, Dave Sikorsky's comment was actually one of the questions I have about this motion is would uh, would these projections, population projections, be based on uh, 2022 catch? Uh, and, and if so, I uh, guess a question to Emily. Uh, this is, I guess, a reminder for us. Uh, it's through wave five. What what does the uh, 2022 recreational harvest look like compared to 2020 in 2021? Thanks for the question. So to the first part about would these projections um, proposed on the screen here use 2022 um, catch data? So the plan, um, as discussed in November, you know, the board expressed interest in evaluating 2022 removals as soon as possible. So the initial plan is for the technical committee to meet in March to take a look at the preliminary MRIP data, because at that time we'll still only have preliminary data. We also in March will not have final 2022 commercial data. So the TC for the May Straight Bass Board meeting can provide a preliminary analysis and potentially preliminary projections with 2022 catch data, perhaps incorporating these scenarios on the screen if this is something the board wants. 
And then the TC could provide additional analysis at the August meeting once they have all the final 2022 data. Um, and then as far as the preliminary 2022 MRIP data, um, as you mentioned, we only have waves one through five. Um, you know, we've taken a quick look at those, but they're, you know, incomplete without wave six. If we're comparing 2022 waves one through five with 2021 waves one through five, uh, recreational harvest increased, recreational live releases decreased. Overall, you did see because of that increase on the harvest side, uh, proportionally, there's a, an increase in removals in 2022 relative to 2021 only for waves one through five. This is a preliminary comparison. We don't have wave six yet. And I'll again see if Dr. Drew has anything to add. No, that covers it. Thanks, Emily. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, th th thank you for that, Emily. Um, I think, I guess the concern I have is um, the, the catch that occurred in 2022 may kind of, over, kind of swap out uh, the, these projections as far as, you know, the, what we're looking at as far as the impacts to the commercial harvest and put us in a different management situation when we uh, look at the final numbers uh, uh, late, later this year. So um, I guess with that, I'm, I don't know if I could support this motion right now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Dennis Abbott. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I came here today to vote for status quo not entirely based on the public comment that we received in New Hampshire, but because I felt that the imposition of quota trans transfers would have some effect on the population. We just passed Amendment 7 where we made a commitment to rebuild the stock by 2029, and I can recall myself making a remark probably 15 years ago that striped bass management was suffering from a thousand cuts by making these little small changes. Uh, I agree with Jason's thoughts on going forward and looking at the commercial quarter issue in its entirety, but I see that as a separate issue based on what the addendum was asking us to do, which was to either approve status quo or four options. And, and I think that we should really go back to status quo and then as an entirely new measure, and I think it's entirely justified in looking at the commercial allocations and everything surrounding it in the future. I appreciate Delaware's positions, but again, I think that based on what we sent out to the public, we should be voting on one of those five options that's in the document. And then further on, if we stick with status quo, then consider whether we want to move this forward at some point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Additional questions on the motion? Bob, we'll go to you. John does have a question after that. Oh, I didn't have a question. I, I had a comment. Oh, oh I'll Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a comment, I think, not a question, and not in favor or in opposition to this motion. But I think based on Emily's comment where some analysis could be done on the preliminary data for the May meeting, but a more robust analysis could be done by August, I think we need, you know, the board should decide when they expect this report back from the TC if they go this route. Or, you know, will 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 there be adequate analysis by the May meeting to take action in May or is it in August? I think, you know, just somehow we need to clarify that before we vote, I would think, just so that there's common expectation of when, if and when this comes back up and how it be handled. So it seems like there's a couple options moving forward and timing-wise. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I, no, I'm sorry, John. You, you had a comment, correct? Uh, yes. There's, are you taking comments now? Or okay, yeah. I, I uh, thank Jason for the um, the thoughtful motion there, because to me it gets to 
one of the, the big questions here, which is for the board just in general, is how do we decide who gets the strike pass? I mean, in our deliberations, we're always trying to accommodate recreational. To me, it seems much more recreational than commercial right now. And I appreciate the effort of the anglers who took the time to express their concerns about the quota transfers, but we got to look at the big picture. As managers, we want our fisheries to serve as many of our constituents as possible. I mean, within the recreational sector, we acknowledge we have a strictly recreational side of fishing. And then we have a commercial side, and that's the for hire side of recreational fishing. And we hear from them, which is great. I mean, they, they should be out here talking to us, but we don't really acknowledge that on the commercial side, uh, in addition to the commercial fishermen, we have a market side of commercial fishing. And, you know, I'm not just talking about seafood market and restaurants, but to the huge numbers of the public that would like local seafood. I know in the mid-Atlantic, as we've brought up at every one of these meetings when we've been requesting more quota, is that um, we have people that don't fish, but it's traditional seafood throughout the mid-Atlantic to have striped bass. And, you know, as I said, I just want this board, the, uh, what we were asking here, you know, again, less than 1% if all of North Carolina's quota was transferred, but we wouldn't be asking anywhere near that much. I mean, I just want us to look at the big picture when we are uh, considering this. If it's the board's will to turn this into a strictly recreational species, that's a whole different conversation. But this idea that any change to the commercial uh, quota is off limits, I just, think that's, you know, that's something that should be looked at in a, uh, by the board over time here. And I think uh, what Jay's motion here makes clear is that we can take a look at this and again, assess the impact of what we're actually asking. Again, option D, the board would have full discretion over transfers. It's a very conservative motion and we're not asking for a lot here. And just this idea that any change to the commercial fishery is going to be the end of striped bass, I think is, it's just not productive. And I think we really do have to look at this from the big picture as to who are we managing this for? Are we managing it for our entire public or just for one sector of our public? Thank you. All right, thanks, John. Um, in deference to some commissioners that haven't spoken yet, I'd like to get shipped to them. Uh, we have Sheree Patterson online. And then we're going to go to Bill Hyatt, then Tom Fogey, and then back to Dennis. And we hopefully are getting close to wrapping up. So, Sheree? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question um, with this substitute. What is the intent behind it? And is is the intent to change if 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 we get answers to this and we might want to consider a change to the addendum? Um, I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure why the substitute when this can happen with the first uh, motion in the sense that, um, you know, it would be up to the board to determine whether to move quota. We can have these answers associated to uh, whether the board would make that decision. So I guess I'm wondering why, in reality, this motion is going to change any decision from the first motion. Um, thanks. Jason, do you want to respond? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, and, and thanks, Sherry. I, I think it's a it's a really good question. So um, to clarify, my intent uh, was not to change the uh, addendum at all. It, it, what I, you know, noticed in kind of reviewing the materials was this piece of it, of, it was a question, this question kept coming up. And so our job as managers is to look at this, kind of weigh the evidence and, and make a decision but questions aren't evidence. Um, and so I thought there was an opportunity 
and so often we don't have an opportunity like questions are kind of rhetorical and, and we can't answer them but here's when we can and so i saw value in answering the questions about um you know what happens if um we run the projections with the the commercial quarter being harvested and what is the impact so that, that was my intent it just generates um, additional information with which we can make our final decision um, not to change the addendum. Thanks, Jason. Sherry, does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go to Bill Hyatt and then Tom Fody and Dennis Abbott, and I'm hoping to wrap up at that point. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to make a comment in response to what Bob Beal said, and in response to what Emily said regarding the 2022 uh, harvest data that we have so far. I mean, Bob was talking about the, the need with regards to this substitute motion to put a time frame on it. Is this something we're shooting for to decide in May, or is it something that we're shooting for in August? And and in in in, in reaction to what Emily was saying relative to the appearance of a, of a higher harvest, recreational harvest in 2022, I would suggest that the answer to the question Bob was asking is that, that the time frame for this should be at such time as the full, full confidence that the 2022 data can be worked in in its entirety. Um, I don't know exactly the, the best way to go about doing that to a motion that's to it was 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 made to postpone indefinitely, which technically can't be amended. But um, I'll just throw that out there as a as a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We're now going to go to Tom Fody. Tom, floor is yours. Yes, um, I was listening to your discussion, and I really agree with Sherry. We don't really need this motion at all. This can be done after we basically deal with the first you know, with the amendment addendum. I mean, because I don't think that's going to change the opinion of other people as we really go down the line. It's going to be a decision whether we allow transfers or not tra have transfers. I can't support this motion because I think we really you know, we can do, deal with the question now. If we approved any of these, then we need to basically do this, get this information to basically act upon it, and we're going to vote. So we really should decide because we're just dragging this along. Thank you. Hi, Tom. I, I'm really sorry, but I'm not sure what the technical difficulty was. We we really couldn't hear you very clearly. Um, it was garbled. I don't know if you need to separate, provide some distance from your microphone. Maybe we could try one more time, um, just maybe back away from the microphone a little bit. I, we just didn't quite hear you. Yeah, I'm I'm away from home. I'm a five hour time difference, and I wouldn't bring them extra mics with me, so I'm basically limited to what the, the microphone on the um, on the computer has. And can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, it's really difficult. Tom, I'm sorry. Um, we're, we're just gonna have. To, I guess we have to move on. Um, I'll try to call in. I'm sorry, Tom. We just can't hear you. We're trying. Um, Tom, if you can dial in, um, that might be better if you use your telephone instead of your computer. Tom, if you can do that, we're going to go ahead with two other speakers and we'll reserve your spot if you can dial in. Okay, so we have Dennis Abbott and Craig Pugh has, uh, has indicated he'd like to talk and because he is a Delaware commercial fisherman. Um, I'm gonna honor that. So we'll go Dennis, Craig, and then we'll save Tom's spot if he can get on through the telephone. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. A, qu a question for you, Martin. A question for you. Assuming we go ahead and do what Jason is suggesting, which is not a bad idea on the one hand, on all hands, then after we get whatever information is derived from that action, do we propose that we're going to have to go back out to public hearings 
so the public can weigh in on whatever new information has been provided, or are we going to come back as a board and, and make the, a vote? It just seems unclear to me that are we going to be voting on the same five options based on some additional information? Is that what we're going to do, and is that where we should be going? Thanks, Des. Emily, is that something you're going to address? Sure, I'll start and then I'll perhaps turn it over to Bob. Um, so, yes, if this motion to substitute were to pass and then the main motion is substituted, this motion were to pass, um, the board would postpone any vote on which option to choose. The TC would conduct these projections and would come back to the board with that report on the projections. Uh, we would not need to take this out for public comment. The board would be going back and looking at the same set of five options with having this new TC report in hand. So I'll turn it up to Bob. Yeah, generally we don't, you know, if there's a technical clarification and, and which this is to some degree, we usually don't go back out to public hearings. Um, the same five options will be available to the board when when they, you know, if this were to pass and they get back together and vote again. So I would think not, you know, but the board always has a prerogative to go back out for another round of hearings if they feel there's significant new information. So, I mean, I think this is really clarifying a number of questions that the public brought up during the public hearing. So it's, it's providing that information to the board that the public didn't have. So I, I don't think the public's perspective really would change that much. I think it just provides the the additional background for the board to better understand where the public's concerns came in. So I, I would suggest you probably don't need to go back out for public hearings. Thank you, Des. Thank you, Bob and Emily. All right, um, do we have, oh, Dennis, did you have a follow to that? Okay, thank you. Did we, did we get Tom back on the line by any chance? Did you dial in? The access code you entered. He's trying, he's trying to dial in. Okay. Um, all right, so we're close. Um, I'm going to give Craig Pugh the last opportunity. Eric Reed hasn't said a word in this meeting and he asked to talk, so I'm going to allow Eric to take the mic next. You have a, you always have a good chance to break log jams, Eric, so maybe you can move us forward here. <laughs> all right, Marty, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Yes, I happen to be one of the commercial fishermen involved in the state of Delaware. And I've re represented uh, a lot of those people, not only the people that are fishermen, but the people that live here uh, in our state. Uh, for some, it seems as though um, postponing or status quo is, is okay. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm kind of interested in seeing what Dr. McMe has provided here. I think it does answer a lot of questions. So I do, I do support that. But to think that this is something that just came up two days ago is way wrong. This has been a disparaging quota that we've received in the state of Delaware for nearly 35 years. We have tried to work with this uh, over year after year after year, uh, multiple years of waiting and trying to deal with things and other excuses, more excuses, more excuses. Uh, about waiting to to move forward with this uh, so that maybe hopefully we could acquire uh, a regional quota that would be acceptable and marketable for our state as it is now we are a minuscule part of the coastal quota uh, and we represent a minuscule part of the marketability for our people uh, and our fishery is alive with the fish I often hear dire things about the striped bass, which uh, we do not recognize. That uh, it's not necessarily what that would be a, a, an untruth told told to us here in this state. Uh, we would like to move forward in some fashion. Whether you know, I am also, as Mr. Sikorsky said, uh, I am also in the reallocation camp. But why we must wait to get a fair shake here? I don't understand. I've, we've waited and waited. We've argued and argued. We've moved through excuse after excuse. Um, I need some help. Our people here need some help. We have the fish. I hear a lot of talk about climate change and 
fisheries moving northward, and I think uh, black sea bass kind of goes along with that. Maybe menhaden too. Uh, this is a tool in the toolbox, just like these other fisheries. Uh, it will help us to a small amount. But the, you know, the true the true thing that, that must be done is a reallocation, uh, but not something that we're going to wait for another 20 years. Uh, I've watched the two generations. Uh, now our children are moving into this uh, type of fishery that uh, you know, they're, they're kind of wondering, what can the ASMFC really do for us? If you've been this long, uh, with this disparaging quota, how much longer will this last? And from what I hear today, it sounds like another 20 years. Uh, if we listen to Mr. Abbott, he wants to postpone or stay status quo. We don't want to do that. We want to be able, we came here to work with the other states. Uh, and we, this is a true issue. It's been an issue for a long, long period. And we'd like to move through that if we could. Uh, and then hopefully move through the other states' bigger issues. Uh, so understanding is what we need here, uh, not cancellation. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for your patience and your words. Appreciate it. We're down to two comments. We'll go to Eric Reed and we'll try Tom Foley one more time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. So I would, I support. Mr. Clark's original motion, um, but I would prefer Mr. McNamee's motion because I think if Mr. McNamee's would fail, then we would be faced with status quo, generally speaking, and I don't think that's the way to go. So I support, I'll support Mr. McNamee's motion because I think that's a smart way to go. But my question really is, uh, you know, it was said earlier that a, a pound of transfer from one state of commercial quota to another state is not necessarily equal, right? My my real concern is, in my mind, a pound of commercial quota to the recreational fishery is not equal either. And we've got 215,000 pounds of quota from New Jersey that's transferred to the recreational fishery. The commercial quota is uh, it's well controlled and it has a low discard rate. The recreational fishery is, is an open access fishery and it has a very high discard rate. So I'd like to understand what that is because the commercial fishery is really negligible in this whole equation. And it's just, to me, if, if I could better understand that, it would, be, it would be a slam dunk to me to not worry about it and do the transfers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Eric. Um, did Tom get through on the phone? We, we don't have him. Okay, we'll go ahead and call the question. Um, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just wondering, returning back to the Bill's comment, um, whether it would be good before we vote on this to have some clarification on when we're going to come back and reconsider this, and then how we go about doing that, whether we need to modify the motion or, or just sort of have an understanding of when the technical committee is going to provide the report. Thanks, Justin. I would turn to Bob and Tony. Would it just be a, the maker of the motion? Could, could modify their motion to include timing at this point, or we need to modify the motion? There is an agreement at the table. We know when we're coming back. That's fine. So to clarify, or sorry, to have Justin, did you have a? Thank you. I was just going to, if there's been an agreement as to when we're coming back, when is that? So yes, yeah, so we don't have agreement yet, so I would, if. Jason, if you had a recommendation on timing, um, when you would like the board to reconsider this action, either at the May meeting with preliminary analysis or at the August meeting with final data analysis. Yeah, uh, thanks. So it's funny. I um, totally thought about this, and, and what I was trying to avoid at the time was kind of um, boxing the technical committee. And I didn't know, you know, how long it would take them. It, I'm getting the sense that they're sort of working on this. Um, it could, you know, be in front of us in May, and that would be my preference. So if we could set it. Um, to have that information back in front of us in May, uh, I would, uh, I think that'd be great. 
Thanks, Jason. Do we need to modify? As long as the board agrees that, but Jay, are you asking that we include the preliminary preliminary 2022 recreational data in this projection or not? That it that we need to know. That's we will right. not have 20. We will not have 2022 commercial data in May. Well, in time to bring you something for the May meeting. And we would only have the waves one through five preliminary for MREP. We would not have final numbers in time. We would have wave six preliminary as well. We just sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just making sure that that was over. You know, a preliminary is totally fine with me. I think um, even, you know, the, the idea here, even in the complete absence of um, the actual commercial harvest, we, we know what the quotas are, and so we can run the projections with that. So that part is dispensed with. Um, with regard to the recreational information, yeah, if we have the first five waves, we need to make some sort of projection. In the end, the interest is not necessarily, I mean, there's interest in the recreational data, but seeing the effect of the commercial data is the real intent of this. So I'm fine with May and having it be preliminary, at least elements of it. Dr. Davis, uh, just a second here. The motion, are you okay with the decision with preliminary data for May? To come back in May? Yep. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and call the question. I'd, I'd like to ask the board is a two minute caucus sufficient? I see nods. We'll have a two minute caucus. All right, we'll go ahead and call the question on the substitute motion. Motion to substitute. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Hold your hands. Okay. Lower your hands. All those opposed, raise your hands. The motion passes 13-3. Was that all, all six? Was that all the votes? Everyone accounted for? Yep. Okay. So it was 13-3. All right. So the motion passes 13-3 and now becomes the main motion. Massachusetts. Uh, there was a question of who voted against the motion. Uh, Massachusetts, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, and North Carolina. All right, so the substitute becomes the main motion. Um, is there a need for a caucus? Don't see any heads nodding, so we're going to go ahead and call the question. All in favor, please raise your hands. <laughs> Lower your hands. 
All those opposed, raise your hands. Good. Is it 14? Fifteen one. Motion passes fifteen one. Okay. Okay. All right. So we got we've gotten through that. Um, this point, um, the motion is passed. So we, we've got our options. So this has been a postponement, correct, to the to the May meeting. Um, and then I guess at this point, staff will present information ahead of time so we can be prepared for that, dis that discussion at the, at the May meeting. Are there any questions following the vote and procedure, or any, any um, process going forward? Seems to be straightforward. Dave Stacorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to say that you know that happened rather quickly, and and um, while I missed the opportunity to substitute, um, you know that's what I came here to do today, and unfortunately that opportunity to lost. So I'll call it a difficulty of being here on the webinar instead of in the room, but such is life. So I look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right. I guess the next step is going to be any other new business to bring before this board. Is there any? Seeing none, let's take a motion to adjourn. Justin Davis, second by Ray Kane. Straight past board is adjourned. Thank you.